Good morning to those of you joining us for worship, and in particular our time of Bible study this morning. Uh, my name is Terry Seibert, and I'm the preacher for the Cortland Church of Christ, and we, we welcome you. We are truly honored that you would want to join us in our study this morning. As we continue to delve into the field of Christology, the field of study that's known as Christology, we certainly do not, cannot overlook the baptism of Jesus. Um, this particular subject also invites study as to how the baptism of Jesus harmonizes with the Christ Jesus who is fully divine and also fully human. And in this case of the baptism of Jesus, all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John's is a little bit different, but John also touches on the baptism of Jesus. All of them, as you can imagine, in the opening chapters of each of those gospel accounts. I've given you the particular reference points in your newsletter today. You can find it online. But what I would like to say about these is I'd like you to write them down and study them in advance of next Sunday's sermon. Uh, we're going to tackle this subject of the baptism of Jesus as it relates to his humanity next Sunday. And as you read these citations from the four Gospels, keep asking yourself, you've probably been asking yourself this over the years, every time you cross over the baptism of Jesus in your studies, why, why, the question is, why did Jesus need to be baptized? And maybe to be worded a little bit more precisely, why did Jesus choose to be baptized? I think it's saying the same thing. Uh, Jesus chose to be baptized because he needed to be. And the question is, what caused Jesus to need to be baptized? So, let those questions mull around in your mind as you read these scriptures. And any, if any of you get a real bright light that comes on and you want to take the sermon for that Sunday, uh, next Sunday, I'll be glad to yield some time to you. It's a challenging subject and we'll try to approach it in a fair way, but join us next Sunday for that topic. And for those who like to study even a little bit more in advance, on the last Sunday of this month, <clears throat> we're planning to examine uh, from Matthew chapter uh, 4, the baptism of Jesus is talked about in Matthew's gospel in chapter 3, and then as we move right into chapter 4, you remember that uh, Jesus goes into the wilderness, and for 40 days and 40 nights, he is tempted by Satan. So again, as you study in advance uh, to the wilderness temptation of Jesus, uh, if Jesus was fully God without being fully human, could he really be tempted in all points like we are? That's the question for your pondering between now and two weeks from now. Well, in our current series, which we've titled Probing the Passion, we have been looking more carefully at the humanity of of Jesus. There has been written a lot of things with a multitude of discussion as to the deity of Jesus Christ, which is an all important topic. Nobody is denying that in any way. But on the other hand, <clears throat> there has not been nearly enough discourse and study concerning the human side of Christ Jesus. This is quite blurry in our uh, education and our biblical education, if you, if you think about it. So I begin my uh, study this morning by saying to us that we must be diligent to not downplay the humanity of Jesus. Now, if you joined us right now in the middle of the study, you would say this is a bizarre sermon. But it's not at all bizarre as it connects with everything that we've been building up to. The acknowledging the full humanity of Jesus is a, a, a vitally important undertaking, and that's what we're trying to do. So 
For this morning, let's pick up where we left off last Sunday, and then next Sunday we'll, we'll turn our attention to the baptism of Jesus. This is a, a covered this Sunday, and my intention is truly not to be too long-winded. I, I was a little bit last Sunday. Not that I need to apologize for that, and none of you have come to me and said, boy, you need to cut it short, and I appreciate that. But uh, I, w I, I felt like I was a little bit long, and I was a little bit long. So I, I don't want to be that this morning, but if I am, you'll bear with me. Sometimes it's hard to condense your thoughts, and even if you... Uh, deviate from your written notes it tends to uh, you tend to ramble sometimes and I think that's what I did a little bit last Sunday for good or bad well let's begin this morning by rereading a text found in 1st Peter chapter 2 verses 21 through 23 so I'll give you just a moment to turn there so that you can follow it in your own translation 1st Peter 2 verse 21 and following <clears throat> for you, Peter's writing to a first century audience who would have been re receiving this epistle, but he's writing to them, to common, ordinary Christians, men and women, uh, following after Jesus. And he says, as he writes, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. In last Sunday's sermon, which I titled, The Man Christ Jesus, we spoke of this. We spoke of Peter's exhortation to a first century audience and secondarily to all those who would read thereafter. To all of us who are Christians, Peter's exhortation to follow in the steps of Jesus. <clears throat> if we fail to properly capture the teachings of Scripture concerning the full humanity of Jesus, I'm convinced that that will work in a rather insidious and perhaps even sublim subliminal way to erode our faith. Now, that's where I left off last week, and let me give just a little bit more explanation. This word insidious refers to something that comes in in a subtle way. Uh, maybe a good definition would be stealth. It sneaks in. Sometimes the word sneak is used when you're talking about something that's insidious. We don't see it coming. By subliminal, I'm referring to our subconscious thought. I'm taking a B12 vitamin now twice, a, uh, once a day at least, maybe twice a day. It's uh, something I take sublingually. I put it under my tongue. Subliminal doesn't mean under tongue, it means under your brain, or it's uh, metaphorical really. It just means below the surface. So you're thinking about something below the surface. You don't actually articulate it, but subliminally you're thinking about this. So some I think, hopefully not everybody, but some read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. They, they read that exhortation from Peter to follow in his steps, for us to follow in the steps of Jesus. They read it with the tendency to rationalize Peter's admonition. In our deeper, in our unexpressed thoughts, sometimes we might be prone to conclude that we really can't follow in the steps of Jesus. After all, he was God. He was God's only begotten son. 
And the scriptures say about this Jesus who walked on planet earth, that he was fully full deity. He was God in the fullest sense. So we may not come out and say it out loud, but all of us, I would almost be certain to say that all of us have used this line of thought, subliminal thought. I know the scriptures tell us to follow in his steps, but how can we? He was God. We're just humans. If this kind of thought is what is pervasive in our minds, it will train wreck our effort to pursue genuine discipleship. It will derail us and it will absolutely destroy and defeat us. This is the insidious side. None of us would dare to cut out this passage from our Bibles. We would not go to 1 Peter 2, 21 and 23 and say, I don't like what this is saying. I don't get what this is saying. Therefore, I'm going to excise it. I'm just going to snip it out. None of us would dare to do that. We're told to follow in his steps, but we're not like him. That's, that's what we think. He was God and we are flawed human beings. But I'm telling you this morning, if you read the Bible that way, it makes a mockery of the scriptures. I keep saying all along, this is a really important series. Maybe we haven't fully grasped the significance of it just yet. Seems like every Sunday, somebody came up to me last Sunday and they said, I think I'm getting it. I think I'm getting it. This is after several, several weeks. And uh, boy, is it encouraging to hear comments like that and see the look in people's minds or eyes. On the other hand, and here's where this sermon series becomes so important and so practical. If we properly understand that Jesus emptied himself, I'm not making that up. That's what Paul declared in Philippians 2.5. Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be clung to. He emptied himself. If we properly understand that Jesus emptied himself so as to become fully human, then we can, we can realistically and actually inspire to follow in his steps. Jesus came to earth. Yes, he was all God. He was God in the fullest sense. But something, perhaps something that we can never fully comprehend also took place in that Jesus emptied himself of some of his divine prerogatives or privileges and became fully human. And it was in this fully human form that he showed us how to walk, how to step. These are the steps that we're to follow. Not a God, the Son of God, who came and was totally insulated from humanity, Jesus didn't come to earth and God place him in a bubble and say, I'm not going to allow you to be contaminated. You'll never be just like them. Just the opposite. God sent him to become incarnate and to, to be fully human with us and to show us how to live the human life. If we can correctly comprehend the words of Hebrews 2 and verse 17, and the, this is a passage that I think has been lost in our teaching as a brotherhood. I don't, I don't know that us preachers have dwelt on this nearly like we should. But there the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus had to be made like his brethren in all things. <clears throat> That's another way of saying what Paul said in Philippians 2.5. 
Jesus emptied himself and became a human being in the fullest sense. This reading of Hebrews 2.17, if we read it correctly, it will produce within us a discipleship that is driven by an authentic and unadulterated motivation. We really can strive to be like Jesus. We can really aspire to walk in his steps. He really was like us. And in that sense, we're really like him. We can do this. So that's my opening exhortation to all of us. We can walk in the steps of Jesus. We're going to be reviled, but we can respond by not reviling in return. We can do this. When others speak threats to us, we can live a life following Jesus where we don't have to utter threats in return. We can really do this. It's not something that just the Son of God in a bubble protected by God from humans this is something that Jesus and his humanity did and lived and showed us. And we can do all of this. And here's the key phrase uh, from that 1 Peter 2, verse 23. How did he do this? How was it that he could not revile in return and not utter threats in return? He did it because he continually entrusted himself to God who judges righteously. That's the key to walking in the human steps of Jesus. Now let me zip on down through page two here on my notes and we won't be long. Jesus gave numerous commands, making a, a variety of demands upon his disciples. That'd be an interesting assignment to go through the New Testament and write down everything that comes across as a, Jesus doesn't say it as an option. He just says, do this and make a list of all of those things. But perhaps the one that would stand out more than others, and that's the one that is most all encompassing in amongst all of his commands is that simple two word exhortation, follow me. Somebody has quipped, I tried to Google it, but Google wasn't cooperating to give me the info. Somebody said, I'd like to give somebody credit for this because it's a really interesting thought, that the Bible passages that really trouble me most are not the ones that I don't understand, but it's the ones that I do. <laughs> and you get his point. Follow me. Nothing hard about understanding that. The hard part is in the doing of it. And we hear these words throughout the ministry of Jesus. The Gospels open up. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. Jesus is walking along and he says to others, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible goes on to say they forsook their nets and followed him and he and they, and they forsook, uh, Luke says, Luke chapter 5 and verse 11 says, they forsook all and followed after him. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. John chapter 1 and verse 43 tells of a similar story to Jesus. Uh, somebody brought Philip to him and he spoke to Philip and he said, follow me. You, you, you know, I'm telling you right, you've read these stories. And then there's a, a couple verses in Matthew's gospel that just jump off the page for us here. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. Jesus said to his disciples, he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It wasn't a specific command to literally be crucified. That's not what Jesus was saying. To literally get your cross and be crucified as I was. It, it, was, a, it was a charge to a way of life. This self-denial and taking up your cross and following after Jesus. And in fact, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Luke says, Take up your cross daily. And follow me. There we realize it's not just a one time death on a wooden cross that Jesus was talking about. It was a way of life. So Jesus calls his disciples to take up their cross and follow him daily. John chapter 8 and verse 12 reminds me of Vic's comments around the table. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John chapter 12 and verse 26, Jesus said, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. If anyone serves me, Jesus said, the Father will honor him. To follow Christ is to serve Christ. To follow Christ is to deny self and take up our cross. John chapter 21 closes this way in verse 18 and following. It records Jesus' words to Peter the Apostle after Jesus' crucifixion, but just prior to his ascension. Jesus said to Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will gird you and bring you where you do not want to go. Now this, he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. Scripture tells us that, or not scripture, but tradition tells us that Peter was crucified, as was Jesus. Uh, some variations on that say that he requested to be crucified upside down because he was not worthy of being crucified as Jesus was. The text goes on to say, when he had spoken this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Peter turned around and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, that was a reference to the Apostle John, following them, the one who also had leaned back on the breast of Jesus at the supper, the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and said to the Lord, Lord, is, it, is, is this the one who betrayed you? Perhaps pointing to Judas as he said it. Peter, therefore, seeing John, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What's going to happen to John? And Jesus said to Peter, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now there we mix a little bit of eschatology along with Christology. Uh, it's it's uh, quite amazing to watch how some people have read over this passage about John and uh, have not acknowledged that perhaps John indeed did live to see the Lord's coming in the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which I think is what that passage refers to. But Peter would not live to see it, and he was crucified as Jesus spoke about. Now, let me bring it to a, a conclusion here. <clears throat> I'm trying to think how I can communicate this to us. Again, not the weakness is not in my audience. It's not that you can't comprehend it. It's that I'm having a difficult time trying to say it in a way that I hope will be the clearest. So let me try. 
If Jesus could only obey the will of God because he was deity in its fullness, if, that, if the only way that Jesus could be successful at obeying God in the fullest sense was because he was God incarnate. He was God in flesh. And if I could describe it, he was God in a bubble. God was protecting him and God was with him in an external, ordinary, super kind of way. If the only way that Jesus could keep the commandments of God and be fully obedient to the Father, was because he was full deity, then can he fairly charge us mere humans to follow him? How honest is that? Again, if I could belabor the point just for a minute, if Jesus knows that he was only successful in going to the cross and submitting completely to the will of God, if he was only successful because he was God's only begotten son, God in the fullest sense, then how can he expect us to succeed in our life here on planet earth? Let me deviate for just a moment, but for a reason. I think of all these commands to follow me, follow me, follow me. And again, if we're prone, we say, how can we follow you? You're God, we're humans. But if Jesus became like his brethren in all things, if Jesus emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, and by, through that means was obedient even to the death on the cross, Then we sit up and take attention and say, he calls us to follow us. He showed us how to do it. His human steps, we can follow those. The apostle Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles, but he was an apostle nonetheless. And he went everywhere preaching the word to the Jews first, but also to the Gentiles, as he would say in Romans 1.16. And he would often tell them, this is recorded in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, here's what Paul says. And it sounds arrogant on the surface, but not at all if if we're in sync with what we're talking about this morning, and that is the imitation of Christ or walking in the steps of Jesus. Can we really do it? Well, here's what Paul would tell others. Be imitators of me. Even as I am an enemy, even just as I am of Christ Jesus. You follow me just as I'm following Christ Jesus. And then he adds in Philippians 3 and verse 17 join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. When you see others walking in the steps of Jesus, follow them. They're following Jesus. And of course, all that is uh, ridiculous if it's not even possible. Paul never argued, we can't do it. He was God, we're human. Paul never made that argument. In fact, he says, you follow me because I'm bent on following him. So in conclusion, I've said that word about five times. Throughout his incarnation, Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. His human side was confronted with daily choices. And Jesus always chose to be obedient. We can follow that pattern. That path of obedience will not be easy. I'm not telling you that. Nobody better ever tell you that. In his humanity, Jesus provided an example for us to follow. 
It won't be easy. Indeed, I think it will be the greatest challenge that we'll ever face in this life. But if we can wrap up now here with a passage from, again, Hebrews chapter 12, which is where our scripture reading was, and wonderful little song that somebody wrote that Consider Him. It's right out of the text of Hebrews chapter 12, the first few verses. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, that's Hebrews 12 and verse 2. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, let, let us determine to never give in. This, this, is what Je- this is how Jesus did it. He fixed his eyes on God. And he determined throughout his incarnation, he would never give in. And let us, let us refuse to give up. Let us give it our, our all, even in times when we feel like we're about to give out. So let us pray that the example of Christ Jesus, our Lord, will inspire us to keep on giving, giving it over to God. That's what the writer meant when he said that Jesus kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. We can do that. We can follow in the steps of Jesus. And we can be real about it, just as Jesus was real about his humanity. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, thank you for our Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love and sending him to become a bridge for us back to you. And thank you, Father, for... The, the exemplary life of our Lord Jesus for living a real human life and showing us how to follow in his steps. Bless us, Father. Help us not to rationalize this uh, goal in life to follow Jesus, but to really be serious about it. Help us each and every day. And may we make our discipleship our determination to follow in the steps of Jesus, to do this each and every day. With his power, we pray. Amen. Thank you for your good attention this morning. Uh, And if we can help any of you in your walk with the Lord, we, we would love to do so. Let's stand together as Nick leads us in this song and encourage each other by our spoken words.